forward to the Okay, uh, so welcome uh, again, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Robichaud. I'm the assistant director here at the Maynard Public Library. And tonight we're delighted to uh, once again have David Mark uh, speaking on the, uh, the history of Maynard's many schools throughout the years. Uh, David is, uh, of course, a member of the town's sesquicentennial uh, steering committee and has been hosting this um, series of uh, talks uh, throughout the year. This is actually uh, I, the eighth, right? Yes. Yes, this is the eighth uh, talk. And um, I should mention that the, uh, the next presentation is going to be on the Maynard family on uh, Tuesday, October 19th at seven o'clock. And that'll uh, lay out how the Maynard family uh, came to build, uh, run and, and operate the woolen mill uh, in what was uh, originally called Acevit Village. And then um, of course, um, as you can imagine, uh, was later renamed Maynard uh, because of, of Amory Maynard. Uh, so more information about the, uh, the upcoming programs in the series, uh, links to all those uh, previously recorded programs. Again, we've, we've had this is, uh, we've had seven before this. Um, and you can view those and also the, uh, the sign up form for the upcoming programs. You can, if you go on our website, uh, maynardpubliclibrary.org, slash May 150, M-A-Y 150, you can get all that stuff. And then uh, for information about the sesquicentennial um, and all the uh, events that they still have uh, planned for the rest of the year, if you go to uh, maynard150.org, uh, you can get that. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to David. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so before I start my slides, I appreciate everyone being here tonight and we're just going to uh, learn about the school system, the buildings and the people that were in and operating those buildings. And I, I think there's a lot of information. Uh, we'll do with then a Q&A at the end. And then if we still have time, there's some bonus slides after that. Now, before I start, I once again, want to plug the book. If you haven't bought it yet, this is the sesquicentennial book. It's available at Six Bridges Gallery at 77 Main Street. Um, for $22. And I'm just hoping that you'll find that this is something just very nice to have around the house. Um, it's sort of a bunch of short, short pieces. So you can also leave it in your, uh, perhaps your guest bedrooms, so your guests have something to read come. Or here's a suggestion. If you have new neighbors in town, this is a sort of welcome, nice welcome to Maynard gift to give to people. So after that plug, we'll get started on this. Uh, let's do, I think, share screen. The talk, share, um, slideshow. Come on, slideshow. Um, Jeremy, are we up and on? Yes. Okay. Um, then here we are. We're talking about the schools for the centuries, and I really do mean centuries because the very first school that we had in this area was um, in 1766, long before Maynard was Maynard. Uh, you can see two columns on this, uh, recently posted at Maynard Life Outdoors. Um, that includes a list of the schools, the years and operations. I want to, as always, appreciate the, uh, the contributions from the Maynard Historical Commission and the Maynard Historical Society. And if you feel you have to tell me that I said something wrong and you want to save for the Q&A, that's a good time, or you can always send it to my email address. Um, let's try this. So um, first, what's going on? This is the 150th anniversary of creation of Maynard. Uh, you can buy the book and today's Zoom talk is about the schools. On October 2nd, uh, there will be Maynard Fest and fireworks that evening. And then I'm gonna say COVID willing, a Maynard history exhibit with items from the collection will be on display at the library for November. COVID not willing, uh, we may bump this to early 2022 when we're all really sure that we're uh, either had our booster shots or got our first set of shots or that the, the uh, COVID is, is fading away. So if we get to it, and then I go, here is a list of all the schools that have existed, all the public schools that have existed in Maynard through the years. Now there's one or two of these that are basically renaming of existing buildings, but most of these are new. And I do wanna point out that I do know how to spell current in the lower right corner correctly, but this is an old slide and there it is, current, current. Um, so there are a couple of schools that, and also the last column sort of shows the fate of these buildings. And you notice we'll touch a little bit later on the fact that uh, there were a fair number of fires 
uh, that affected the school system um, in Maynard. So, and that the current high school, which was open for the 2013-14 year, was, is actually the sixth high school that Maynard has offered to its um, students. So some of you may have heard of what's called the Brick School, um, the oldest, uh, 1766, and then served till really, and this was part of Stowe's district, Stowe's fifth district. And so many of the early settlers here, including Amory Mano's two older sons, Lorenzo and William, attended the school. Um, the building still exists at, I think it's 101 Summer Street. Uh, the bricks are now painted white. Um, now, you have to realize that state law at this time required school, school to age of 14 and require the town's offer at least 20 weeks of school per year. Um, I do wanna say that Amory's youngest son, Harlan, Harlan Maynard was only three at the time of the move and he did not attend the school as a teenager. Um, he was enrolled at the Concord School in Concord. Um, he got there by taking the train. Basically there was the passenger train he would take it to Concord and come back on the train. One of his classmates there was Edward Waldo Emerson, the youngest son of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, we're pretty sure that Henry David Thoreau would take the students on nature walks. So there's an interesting connection between the town of Maynard and uh, some of the most famous people from Concord. The chair, by the way, is an original chair, which was in someone's private collection then donated. So we have this in the collection of the Maynard Historical Society. Okay, if you look at this example of the early schools, basically these were two-story wooden buildings um, heated by either uh, wood or coal stoves. Um, there was the main um, school, which is uh, the site of the current town hall. There was a school on Nason Street, uh, which is currently the site of the library. Uh, there was one on Acton Street, which is where Jarmo's at the, at the end of Main Street, you're looking across the end of Main Street, you see Jarmo's, there was a school there. And then there was what was referred to as the Garfield School, which was at the corner of Main and Sudbury, so that was on the south side of town. And these were basically all these two-story wooden buildings uh, heated by the um, stoves in the room or central furnace in the basement. Um, okay, you say, okay, if that's two classrooms, it looks sort of big. Well, the answer was these classrooms held 40 to 60 students and occasionally more than 60 students. State law said you could have up to 60 students per teacher, but sometimes there were more. It was uh, very different than what we consider now uh, required or, or appropriate for schools. Um, now, I do want to point out that in 1871, salaries for teachers were between nine and $15 a week. Uh, the high school graduating class in 1892 actually chose the school colors of orange and black. So we've had orange and black as the school colors for well over 100 years. Um, in 1937, the school budget, the entire school budget was $98,000. Um, I'm not going to say what that was in inflation adjusted dollars, but one point is, as of a state survey of 83 towns at the time, Maynard was 73rd in expenditure per student. So Maynard was, was well below the, uh, the lower half of what it was spending on, on school for students. And year after year, you can read the annual reports, the annual reports in the collection of the library, the historical society, year after year, you see the report from the superintendent in schools who says that Maynard continually lost teachers to other towns that paid more. Um, interestingly, until the mid 1960s, high school hours were eight o'clock to one o'clock without a lunch break and the students went home at one. Uh, many of them going to part-time jobs in the mill or elsewhere. Um, elementary and middle school students went home for lunch and then returned for an afternoon session. So there was an assumption that some adult was gonna be back at the house um, a parent, a grandparent for them to go home, have lunch, and then come back to school. Uh, a few other milestones in 1949, the school began offering driver's education and in 1955, a new state law required special education. We have two pictures and let's call it a before and after. This is the Nason Street School built in 1892. At this point, everything, everything was consolidated into this one 12 room schoolhouse plus a basement that had all the students at this school. It's a very impressive building, very impressive chimneys, had a bell tower. If there were snowstorms, they'd ring the bell to tell the students they didn't have to come to school. 
Um, it was a wood frame building over stone basement. The construction cost was $20,927. Um, furnishings such as desks, chairs, et cetera, brought the total to 30,000. Well, on September 12th, 1916, a fire caused $200 of damage in the assembly hall. And then eight nights later, a fire completely destroyed the building. Uh, it was of course assumed that it was arson. So the picture you see on the right is people sort of eyeballing what's remaining, which is basically the chimneys. And that was all that was remaining of the site and the basement, uh, which I'm sure most of you realize now was later rebuilt as Roosevelt School and then converted to today's Maynard Public Library. So this is that site. This is from uh, the Nason Street view of it. Um, if you look at the very front of the picture of the school, you'll see a fire hydrant because uh, Maynard had fire hydrants starting in 1888. Um, that's an antiquated design. There happens to be one of these original hydrants still in service in Maynard. I know where it is and I'm not telling you today. I'm hoping though that when the town ever replaces it, it can be donated to the Maynard Historical Society because it is just an interesting idea that we have a fire hydrant, um, I guess virgin on um, 130 years old. Okay, we're going to get very geeky on numbers for a while because I think this gives you a sense of the nature of change in Maynard. The right-hand scale is the population and that's that sort of curve that those straight line sections starting off uh, near the bottom line, which would be on 2000, finishing up at 10,000. Um, each point basically represents the 10 year census. So the, the slopes don't count as much as the points, but you can see that somewhere around the late 1890s, there was a sudden huge leap up in population to 1910. This is when American Woolen Company bought the mill after it had gone bankrupt in 1898, uh, built a lot of new buildings, uh, hired a lot of people, and there were a lot of tremendous number of immigrants coming to town who were Finns, Irish, Italians, um, and Poles, and um, like all good uh, people at the time. They got married, um, they had children, and there's this huge spike in births that got us to over 250 births per year in Maynard. Now, the, and you can see then there's a steep decline, and it stays very low through the Depression and uh, World War II, but then there's the baby boom. Um, that again reached a peak, uh, oh, sort of in the mid 60s and then declined. And then it sort of has settled down. Unfortunately here, I don't have data after 2010, but I, I think we're still hovering in that area of 100, 150 births per year in Maynard. You notice that even the population keeps going up, the death stays constant and then starts going down. And my assumption here is, that, is this for two reasons. One, people are living longer. You have to realize that, um, with antibiotics and vaccines and, and drugs that control blood pressure and heart disease uh, and cancer, there are fewer deaths. And also I imagine people as they're getting older are moving away from Maynard. So they may be dying, but not dying here. I will point out that you'll see this little spike over here. You can see my arrow in 1918. That is the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1920, when Maynard lost about 1% of its population um, to the flu. Okay, a different curve, and this sort of looks at the hundred years in between. So, because it's on the same scale, uh, the orange line is showing that 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 big birth peak here. It looks very subtle, and then there's the baby boom peak here. But the point is, there's a lag time between those birth peaks and the school population going up and up and up and up and, up and then down and down and down. So you realize here we're at around 750 students in the entire school population, a decrease, and then. Around, oh, 19, I guess it was, uh, what are the years? Okay, 68 to 75, we're, we're up around 2,000 students. So this is very harsh on the school system. What do you do when it's increasing this steeply and this steeply, you're building schools, and then it's dropping, and you're closing schools or recycling schools. Uh, as we know, Coolidge School was closed. Uh, and, and there's always this future, what's happening now is Maynard's population has reached up towards 11,000 of the last census. So just keep in mind the school system is not a, a steady state. It can be, I'm gonna say jerked around by uh, demographics. And right now, for my 20 years in Maynard, my sense is um, 
people are not necessarily, you know, staying in place. There's a turnover, younger couples, I'm calling it the stroller set, but there's just a lot more younger people with young children showing up in Maynard. And I'm sure that's moving into the school system and as anticipated. We now see here the Wilson School. Um, it's called the first real brick school. So it's two stories over a basement. It's where the town hall is now. Uh, it was on operation from 1903 to 42, and then it was mothballed and then opened up again six years later with the beginning of those students. And then this one was also destroyed by a fire. Um, so it was the morning of December 17th, 1952, and the building was totally destroyed by a pre-dawn fire. No one was in the building. The town received um, almost $60,000 in insurance. The land, which had originally deeded by the Maynard family to be used only as for schools, was seized by eminent domain for the town to build the town um, hall and library on that site, completed in 1962. Okay, here we have a similar school. It's called the Bancroft School, later the Coolidge School, excuse me. You notice initially in this colored postcard image, it's only one story. So that was 1906. And four years later, they said, okay, not enough school and put a whole second story on it. So the second story was added in 1910. It was officially named Calvin Coolidge School in 1932. The same town meeting that the Main Street School became Woodrow Wilson. So I guess we were, we were big on presidents at the time. Okay, we're gonna to touch on state laws and schooling requirements because it does sort of dictate what towns had to do. Um, 1872, uh, they allowed up to 60 students per teacher and was some exceeded. 1887, a child shall go to school at least 20 weeks per year. Maine was usually doing, most towns are doing sort of around 35 to 38 until age 14. Um, 1891, schools will provide textbooks. And I think it was around this time the high school actually got its own library. 1898, no child under 14 years of age should be employed in any factory, workshop, or mercantile establishment. Uh, however, um, children under 14 could still work on, for example, on, on farms and other types of places. 1911, a little bit patriotic schools will have a flagpole with an American flag. 1913, all children must retain a school till 16 years old. One important point here is, is that if you looked at the high school population around this time, the freshman and sophomore student population would be about 60 or 70 for each of those class years. Uh, the junior would be half that, maybe 30 students, because a lot of them as they hit 16, dropped out and went to work in the mill. Um, often their parents wanted them out of the school as quickly as possible because they wanted the income from their children. And the senior graduating class would be as small as, as 15, 16, 17 students. The last point here is in 1981, uh, some of you remember Proposition Two and a Half, a limit on tax increases, led to this town to the dismissal of 25 teachers, 26 non-teaching positions, mostly because it coincided with the, the decrease we saw in the earlier slide of the number of students, but it was sort of, let's call it harsh on this teaching population. Okay, Roosevelt School, 1918 to 1988. Uh, you see it extremely well decorated and all the students are outside for a main centennial. And the picture on the right basically looks very familiar because that's what it looks like uh, now that the library is there. Uh, the library was, um, I think we got the, this next slide. We point out that the building was erected in 1918, closed in 88, but then the renovation was completed in 06. There was a long period that the building laid fallow uh, before it was converted into the current library, pretty much by building a modern shell inside the existing brick. The town, of course, has had a library for a long time. 1881, Maynard did fund a library. It was open only two evenings a week. 1885 was moved to the Riverside Co-op, which is um, where what was the Knights of Columbus building uh, on the corner of, of, of Summer and Nason is. Uh, the co-op at that point was a larger wood building, not the big brick building that there's now. 1918 moved to Naylor Block. Um, interestingly, both the Riverside site and the Naylor site burned. So maybe fire was chasing the library, but it was moved, what well, didn't have to be there when the fires were there. 1962 moved to its own building next to Town Hall. That's been the police station as of Illinois. And 06 on the site, which had been Rosa School, is now our public library. 
Coolidge has also um, been decommissioned as a school. So you see on the, on the left, uh, the entrance, the building, on the right, the fact that it looks to be, be converted over the next couple of years to the Calvin Schoolhouse Loft. I think the proposal is up somewhere between 10 and 12 two bedroom apartments, retaining as much as possible the exterior of the building as historic. And the building is limited to the building itself and a parking lot so that the, the snow slope, the sledding slope and, and the playground below it uh, remains a town playground. So it took a long while, but not as long as it took to figure out what to do with Roosevelt School to turn this in, to find a buyer for this. And, and, and basically the buyer paid a very modest amount for the building, but it's far less than what it would cost just to tear it down. So the town is happy that the building will become a, a property tax producing building and, and rather than something the town has been paying to manage. I touched on fires, so I just want to say that we did have a number of school fires. Uh, 1879, Nason was partial. 1916, Nason was a total. You saw the picture. 1952, again, Wilson, the brick shell remained, but everything inside was burned. So again, a total fire and a tear down. There was actually then a 1977 fire. It was uh, Emerson Fowler on Summer Street. It was partial but severe, repaired, and a uh, more modest fire at the high school in 1992. Again, repaired. Fires were not rare events. I think one of the important points is you realize how much of Maynard burned because just a partial list was the paper mill, the music hall, the nailer block, uh, the trolley car barn, the Maynard Hotel, which is where Memorial Park is now, the bent ice house, the Riverside block, which is uh, Gruber's, um, or was the Gruber's building, the Riverside co-op I mentioned, and Amory's mansion was being converted to apartments and it burned in 1965. So fire has been a very big part of, of Maynard's history. Pretty much you'll see the same in almost any of these, these towns, Hudson had its share, Acton had its share, fires fire. And you have to realize that we're talking about houses that were heated by wood, heated by coal, lit by kerosene, lit by candles, lit by glass. Um, there was a lot of open flame and a lot of consequences. The Summer Street schools, and what you see on the left is the house that was there that belonged to Dr. Rich. If you look carefully to the left, you'll see him. Um, and his daughter sitting in his automobile. He was the very first person in town to own an automobile. And this was a Stanley Steamer, a steam powered car. Um, one of the figures standing in the middle of the lawn uh, wearing a dark uniform was the chauffeur who was the first um, African-American um, to be in Maynard. The house itself was moved to Florida Street to make room for the building you see on the right, which is the basically now the East Wing of art space uh, what you see in front of that is the very dirt to Florida Street, sort of leading up to this building. Uh, so that was 1916. And then the center and the West Wing were built in 1926. Um, it was finally abandoned as a school system in 2000 and instantly became art space, which has been occupying it ever since. One problem never solved. If you look at old maps, you'll actually see there was a stream running through this, through the center of this, parallel the Florida Street through that was a Carboni Park and into the Aspet River. So basically the what they did was they, they piped that that little creek underneath the building. Um, let's just say it's not entirely adequate because the basement tends to flood. Uh, the parking lot floods when the rain gets pretty heavy. So what happens when you build on streams, you get water. We see on the left, a graduating class from 1917, all I think 13 of them, all very, very nicely dressed, happy with the diplomas. And on the right, the, the high school baseball team, also 1917. Okay, we know that the school was called Fowler School, or specifically the Geiler Fowler Elementary School. The question was, who was Geiler Fowler? So we now have a picture of him on the left. And let me just get to the right page here. The full name was the Geiler W. Fowler Elementary School, meaning the East Wing of the Summer Street Complex from 1964 on after the high school moved out. Uh, later became the Fowler Middle School, the entire building, and then the name was transferred over to the campuses on the south side of you know, Route 117, uh, where it remains to this day. So Henry Fowler, Geiler's grandfather, was the first signer of the 1871 petition. And at the time he was an undertaker in town. His son, Oren Fowler, 
followed into the family business, continued running the Fowler Funeral Home. And he and his wife, Nellie, were definitely a power couple in early Maynard. He was on the founding boards of local banks, held many town offices. She was a daughter of the American Republic and the first president of the American Legion, Legion Ladies Auxiliary. She was also the first woman to be elected to the school board in Maynard. And Mr. and Mrs. Fowler were among the honorables on the very first electric trolley ride in 1901. They had two sons, um, Geyer and um, Henry, uh, both Harvard graduates uh, and World War I veterans. And um, Henry uh, became a lawyer and, and, and uh, moved to Washington, DC. And then Geyer uh, took up the family business, continued. So it is now named the Fowler Kennedy Funeral Service. There are no people of the name Fowler or Kennedy working there anymore, but often funeral homes want a continuity. So we are continuing to say goodbye to our uh, bereaved people at the Fowler Kennedy Funeral Service here in Maynard. And our Fowler Elementary School continues to be a school in this town, not named for a president. So again, Fowler School. And interestingly, at the time of the centennial, a number of the junior high school students, with the help of their teacher, co collected things for time capsules, was then buried um, in the front lawn of the Fowler School. Now, what you see on the right is the same students now 50 years older trying to dig up that capsule. One of the things they all remembered is it was at the foot of the flagpole. So that's where they're digging, but they didn't find it. The reason they didn't find it is that this is not the original flagpole. The original flagpole was some distance from this in a direction we're not quite sure of. And they were digging at the foot of the new flagpole and found nothing. So if there is a time capsule down there, it, it survives in perpetuity. The next phase for the Maynard school system was to move everything to the schools adjacent to the south side of 117 on a large campus that would provide for parking and playgrounds and for physical education. And by the way, Alumni Field was already there as of 1928. So land was taken from Crow Park and also there was a, a cricket pitch, a cricket uh, playing area there and all this land was taken away for first the Green Meadow Elementary School, um, and then the other men, other elementary schools sort of wound down when Green Meadow was expanded. Maynard High School moved to its campus in 1964, replaced in 19, in 2013. And then the Fowler Middle School uh, finished moving over there in, in 2000. So if we back up a moment and look at high school number five, which served us so well uh, for almost 50 years. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the somewhat modest main entrance and what had been on the wall, the Maynard High School sign. I had actually asked the company that was taking the school apart whether it was possible to at least retrieve or keep the, the tiger emblem from that sign. And what I was told was that the, the wood was so rotten that they basically was crumbling in their hands as they were taking it off. So there was no way to save that. Um, so that just remains this picture as a memory. We do know we had the marching band. In fact, they just marched in the most recent parade. This picture happens to be from 1965. And WAVM, and the AVM stands for Assabet Valley Maynard. The school's radio station began broadcasting in 1973 at 60 hours per week with 75 licensed student broadcasters. Um, they then increased their wattage from 10 to 500 watts. And they now share that, um, I think it's 91.7 with a number of other uh, um, broadcasting, but they still get the broadcast. And they've added cable TV in 1982. So they do the town meetings and just do it a tremendous job. And many of the students have gone through WBM, have gone on careers in, uh, in broadcasting. So it's stu students in very good stead. Now, for those people who've lived here for a while, they know that we've occasionally have approached other towns to find out if it was possible to merge our high school into there. So in the early 1990s, and again, circa 2002, Mania was thinking about mergers. And one of the reasons being is that our building was physically below code. Uh, we were warned you know, we could lose our accreditation in 2002 and actually put on probation in 2006. So there were circa 2007 discussions with all of the regional neighboring high schools. Um, that's Acton, Boxborough, Concord, Carlisle, Lincoln, Sudbury, Neshova, which covers three towns, and Hudson. And in each instance, Maynard was rebuffed. 
um, the reasons given, uh, uh, at least officially, is they had their own space issues. But some were willing to say that they didn't want the Maynard students because they would lower those schools uh, and cast scores in reading proficiency in mathematics. I do want to point out that as of this year, Maynard High School, as a standalone high school, is in the top 30% uh, for the state in reading proficiency in mathematics. So Maynard, in its new high school, has managed to lift itself up by its uh, um, let's call it bootstraps and, and moved up into a much higher level. And most of the students graduate and move on to higher education. But in the end, Maine was left to go it alone and construction of New High School began in 2011 and the school opened for the 13-14 school year. So if we look at this picture of the New High School, it's quite an impressive front facade. I actually took this picture yesterday. So this is very fresh. The lawn's looking very green. And this two-story building with construction began um, and now is, is just will stand us in good stead, hopefully for a long time. And for those of you not been there, I want to point that one of the things the students do is they paint their own dedicated parking spaces. So in the student parking lot, students in September go in there, get an assigned parking space, paint it, and it's theirs. And if you drive over there, you'll see these and all the other parking spaces that have been nicely painted. At this point, I'm gonna turn this back over to Q&A. So I'm gonna stop the share and um, I wanna hear questions, corrections, elaborations. Uh, Jeremy, take it on, either take us what's in chat or let people come in long. I haven't actually received any chat questions yet, but that's okay. This is a good time for you to go ahead and start typing away or you can also, um, raise your hand. And when I say raise your hand, I mean, there's a, there's an option in zoom. Uh, on, if you kind of hover over your, um, your name, you can raise your hand and then you can ask a question uh, to David directly. So either uh, put it in the chat or raise your hand. And we'll say, if you're willing to say with us, I have a few bonus slides afterwards about the private schools that are in Maynard. Uh, checking around. Everyone has to be stunned then. <laughs> this waterfall of information. Uh, okay. I see a hand. I see a hand, sure. Uh, hold on one second. Okay, uh, go ahead, KL Prim. So on the Roosevelt School, the one that burned, you, you showed the picture of the old fire hydrant. Um, what, so was that fire hydrant there before that school burned? And if so, why did the school burn if there was a fire hydrant in front of it? Small fire hydrant, big fire. And if you have to remember it, it uh, at that point we had fire hydrants, but we had a volunteer fire department. And um, I'm gonna call it modest equipment. Um, so, so a two-story wooden building, once, if, it, if it got going, uh, there wasn't much they could do except perhaps keep the fire from spreading to the neighboring buildings. Uh, most of the fires of that era were burned to the ground type fires. Uh, and unless things were slow, started slow, it, 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 um, once fire got away, it got away. Thank you. Do we have um, any any other questions in the audience there? Uh, oh, uh, Jan. Uh, okay, go ahead, Jan. I think uh, I just asked you to unmute. There you go. Yeah, there we go. I did something on my screen so I can't see you guys, but that's all right. <laughs> um, I I wanted to mention. I and tell me if this is true. I thought when the current library was, I won't say built because the building was there already, but when the library was moved from its old location from Town Hall into the nice building that it has now, that part of the reason why the funds were able to be raised was that the committee, the building committee or people you know, making this happen decided that they had to keep the old facade and when the old facade was kept, even though it was a little more expensive to construct the new, you know, construct everything 
and keep the old facade, it was cost effective because people were willing to put money into it because they loved have, being able to say, I went to that old school. And there was a lot of, I guess there was a lot of good feeling among the people who had gone to that school. I wasn't one of them, but it's nice. I think it's a nice story. And is that true? <laughs> um, if anyone knows. Well, I, I can, you know, I, I was, Please, I started in 2010 here at the library, so I can't say for sure. I'm not exactly sure if that, 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 that does sound like a, a possibility. And I can definitely say, you know, having worked here for many years, um, you know, people are always just so thrilled, you know, that if they went to elementary school here, um, they're always just so, you know, especially if they're coming from out of town and, you know, they didn't quite realize what, what, what's been done with the building. They're always so thrilled to see, you know, the, the, out, the exterior looks exactly as they remember it. So I, I, I'm sure that did um, help in fundraising. All right, well, I know the funding was a combination of state money, town money, and money raised by friends of the library, um, or you know, basically put it in that pot. And, and architecturally, you know, um, yes, the shell was kept and they pretty much erected a new building inside of it and a new roof on top of it um, so, so, and that's where all the electricity and then the plumbing and the wiring and the venting all got built in, but they were able to, to basically keep uh, the original shell because it was structurally sound, except for the roof, which leaked. <laughs> um, a little story uh, in that I remember when the construction started at one point, there was a, um, we had 30 cubic yard dumpster. So it's, it's, it's huge and, and quite high and being a curious person, I sort of levered myself to look and it turns out over many, 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 many years, anytime the police department ended up with abandoned bicycle, rather than just throwing it out, they just stored it in the old Roosevelt School building. So when it came time to do the construction, they completely filled a 30 cubic yard dumpster with old bicycles, which if I wish I had a camera, I should have taken a picture of, but I do have that memory. Yeah, you should have taken it to Bikes Not Bombs. They should have perhaps turned over to, you know, Ray and Sons Bicycling and said, okay, let's rehab these and then sell them to yeah. people with a nominal fee, uh, which other towns have done, but didn't happen here. Well. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll, we'll do a, just a few. Pretty cool pictures of the, the library, you know, sometimes pictures taken between 88 and 2006 during the, you know, the construction, you can see inside. Don't, I, don't see the, I don't have any pictures of the bikes, but you can see the, the guts of the building and it was, it was in rough shape. Yeah, but I know there was leaks and there were pigeons and yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a lesson. If you don't take care of a building, it will deteriorate. Uh, anybody else raising their hand? Oh, uh, we've got Steve. Uh, okay, Steve, you're, you're on. Oh, uh, you're muted though. Uh, hold on. Unmute. Okay. Yep. I, I, I simply say that the Roosevelt School continued in use after the Green Meadow School was built. And uh, I, it outlast last at the Coolidge School. And for the, la for the last few years, the way there was, was considerable spirit uh, around the Roosevelt School. Uh, it was much older than uh, Green Meadow. Uh, but uh, playground equip equipment was acquired and so forth. Uh, my wife helped put out a, a, new a newsletter, uh, and uh, I did cartoons of Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt and Teddy Bears, and, uh, and other picked up on that, so people may remem remember uh, school parades where there were a lot of Teddy Bear, Teddy Bear figures, that sort of thing, because uh, the Teddy Bear does this uh, is something that if the a phenomenon uh, happened one while Teddy Roosevelt was president, president. and uh, before that, I'm not sure uh, how many people realize that the school was named for Theodore Roosevelt and not Fred Franklin. Yeah, I but, give uh, it a year. I, I think that that's it was an story. interesting transition. Uh, I, I all have very strong memories of the fight over over regionalization. And that, and that was just between Maynard and our towns. Uh, the considerable disagreement within Maynard. And we had a, the largest just town meeting I've ever been to. It was outdoors. There was a thunderstorm. It, it was just an extraordinary occasion. 
The night before Boxborough, which was uh, invited to join, join just with Acton, which it already was for secondary schools, but with Maynard, voted on. And it was necessary to, to uh, get procedural motion uh, so that that which came first on the agenda would be superseded by a, a, a merger just with Acton. Uh, uh, that passed. I uh, entered approved the the move, uh, but Act Acton did not subsequently, and uh, there were were people from Mird who uh, uh, went to Act Acton and made a lot of noise. Noise uh, as the uh, uh, regionalization. So there there was a good deal of of bitterness after afterwards, uh, and. Uh, then, then school choice was uh, became a big thing, not just in Maynard, but in but in other places, and uh, a number of people uh, uh, end up going out of town. Town for uh, 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 that, that has also worked. So worked both in uh, in recent years in in a, in a number of places. But it's 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 a very complicated and lively has to put it mildly. Yeah, and I wasn't here for it, but I. Or I wasn't paying attention at the time, but I, I, I think that this whole question of how does a small town survive when a graduating class um, is fewer than 100 students? Now, luckily, now remote learning has provided for a lot of enrichment um, that is helping the Maynard system uh, offer courses that it couldn't necessarily offer um, given the small population. Okay, um, Jeremy, are you finding anyone else, or should I just pop into these few? Oh, uh, Mike and Jane Mislin, uh, you're on with David. Yeah, David, your your comments about the fires in the schools got the two of us thinking. We both went to uh, small regional schools, uh, and our memories are a the janitor coming through to adjust our seat uh, at the beginning of the school year, and the janitor oiling the floors every year. Um, so obviously, um, there were some contributing factors to that uh, that conflagration that would occur on occasion. Interestingly, none of the churches in Maynard ever had a fire, so maybe God watches over churches. <laughs> but there, there definitely were school and business fires, and, and some of them were always suspicious. Uh, the paper mill fire was definitely, you know, attributed to arson. Um, there's a restaurant fire more recently, I know, was also attributed to arson. Uh, this is at an Asin Street school, and uh, sometimes a disgruntled employee or a student, and a pack of matches is all it takes. Yeah. All right, Taylor, let's, let's go to the, I'm gonna go back to the screen share and this, and um, oh, let me just bring this down too. Okay, and then if I do this, one point is, come on. Um, Are you people seeing this? Yes, if you can just go to uh, like uh, view slides or sh uh, slideshow. To show I, the I, okay, um, I thought I had that. Let's do slideshow. Um, from current slide. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. to um, you know, I think we'll just have to watch the. Um, I think you can kind of see it. Okay, well, if you can see it. So there was a, a basically private finishing school for girls for a number of years and made it run out of the Smith family house by one Miss Smith. So it was the Smith School for Girls, uh, a private school. Um, then of course, we had the um, St. Bridget's, um, which Proca School was opened uh, for the 1965 school year um, in this building, basically part of the filled in mill pond at 16 classrooms, was staffed by the Sisters of Notre Dame in a convent next door, and it closed in 1986. Uh, the building was then um, reopened up as a school by the Imagio, which is a private school and founded in 1981. It moved into this building though, for the 1995 school year continues to exist and offers a, a Christian-based education K through eight. Um, so that's still in operation as school. And as far as 
possible future schools. There is a proposal for the Beijing Royal School to open a branch here in Manu. And you ask yourself, really? The point is the Beijing Royal School is a private K through 12 school located, of course, in Beijing, China. Um, tuition puts it among the 10 most expensive schools in China. It is also among the top 10 in getting students into top ranked uni US universities. Um, so in May, 2019, uh, the Beijing Royal School purchased the former Stratus Technologies campus on Padamo Road, which had at one point been Dex headquarters, for a school here in Maynard. And the idea is the proposal is for a student body, 300 to 500 students. The population would be composed of one third commuting students from neighbors. And one of the points you have to realize is that, for example, Acton, I think at this point, point is closing on, on being one third Asian origin and population, including a lot of uh, uh, Chinese. And the other two thirds of the students would be residents housed international students, probably half of those from China. And the original in front pre-pandemic pre was to open for fall 2020. It's now uh, indefinitely deferred, but at some point we may have a very interesting private school. And here's a picture of the campus, one of those digitals here in Maynard and probably offering some additional enrichment to the Maynard High School. Uh, in fact, all of the major schools and some interactions. So this is uh, not even near the back burner yet, but it is something that may happen in the future. And I think at that point, I'm gonna go back to stopping the share. If we're done, we're done. If there's a last moment question, let's hear it. Otherwise, I'll just say thank you all so much for again, listening to talk about the history of Maynard. Yes, and um, I, don't, I don't see any questions, but I do want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Again, if you joined us late, I am going to be sending out this, uh, the uh, recording uh, to everybody uh, in their emails. So look out for that tomorrow. And uh, I'm just going to go through one quick time. I don't see any hands going up. All right. Uh, thank you. And thank you, David. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.